I am very grateful to be returning to you and to have the opportunity to share with you some of my research. This talk is based largely on research I began 12 years ago, a little more, but I've included a great deal that leads us specifically to the situation in Ukraine and how it can correlate with recent Ukrainian history and I think be fruitful for the future. First, I wanted to include some pictures from when I was here before. My research on Susanna and the Gospels, I was invited to give in Krivorivnia, and this is from that occasion. The wife of the priest took these lovely photographs. Ukraine can recognize a deep connection with Susanna. In the last century, this nation suffered the oppression of foreign rule. And Susanna's ordeal occurred in a time when her people were subject to the Babylonian captivity. Moreover, the foreign rule in Babylon was corrupt. And that has been a problem because of the foreign rule here in Ukraine. Incidentally, I want to mention that the only woman in the Bible whose education is described is Susanna. For that reason alone, I think she could be of interest to people here at Uku. It not only describes her education, because her parents were just, they had her educated in the law of Moses. That tells us she was educated, but in what she does and what she says, she shows her theological understanding in her prayer, and at one point she paraphrases King David. I love this. Here is a woman who is under stress, and she quotes from the Bible, and what does she quote? She has no hesitation in quoting from an important king of her people. There's no artificial sense that a woman must only cite a woman. There is the sense of spiritual equality here. I wanted to include Uku's statement about the importance of integrity because that we see in Susanna. She risked her life rather than be coerced to act against her beliefs and her character. Yet, Susanna might seem a woman of the Old Testament in the new millennium. What's the connection here? She has an importance that came about right with the start of Christianity. Jesus demonstrated in all that he did that men and women are spiritually equal. And he also showed that he was opening up reality to theosis, to divinization, sanctification. At once, Christians realized that the Old Testament prefigurations or types or foreshadowings of the Messiah pointed to a great deal more. Because Jesus was not just the Messiah, he was God incarnate. The Old Testament types pointed to the human capacity, the possibility of becoming holy, becoming like God. And at once, in the first century, Christians began to interpret Jews, male and female, and Gentiles, male and female, as types of Christ. And the first woman so interpreted was Susanna. And this was expressed through the Greek scriptures. That's why it is particularly fitting for the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church 
to know about this woman. All three synoptic gospels draw on the history of Susanna in recounting the passion of the Lord. I was stunned when I realized that. Matthew has the greatest set of parallels. He has 33 parallels between her experiences and Christ's experiences. And 17 of these are expressed by language quoted from her history. 52 words of the Greek come from Susanna's history. Now Luke and Mark share several parallels, but I shall look at Matthew today. You can get the idea of this simply by looking at a summary of both experiences. An innocent lives in a time when the Jewish people are under foreign rule. A righteous person frequently goes to a garden. Corrupt persons want to trap the innocent. And three days after they decide to do this, they do that. They trap the innocent in a garden. They arrest the person. The elders of the people, the phrase is used in Matthew and in, in Susanna, come together intending to secure the death of the innocent. A trial is held with two judges presiding and two false witnesses testify against the innocent who is condemned to death. Most unusual is the fact that a second trial is held and the judge at the second trial publicly states I am innocent of the blood of this one. All the people, pasolaios, cry out in response. The condemned is led to execution. When death is near, then that one cried out in a great voice saying, my God. We recognize this describes the passion of Christ. But all these details were already in Susanna's experiences. In fact, these parallels are unique in the Bible only to the woman Susanna in the Old Testament and the man Jesus in the New. Now, every parallel I have discussed in print so I throw this in, in case you want to look at all the details. Today, I'll just mention the four longest passages. The pre-trial intention to condemn to death. The elders of the people came together intending against Susanna to condemn her to death. Notice the same words again in the description of Jesus' experience, against Jesus, in order that they could condemn him to death. The gender of the pronoun is different. But we have the same language. Fascinating to me is that we have this same parallel repeated just a few verses later with the addition of the word, the elders. The elders came together against Susanna to condemn her to death. The elders came together against Jesus that they might condemn him to death. I think Matthew is stressing the fact that just as Susanna was in danger from her own people, so the Lord Jesus was in danger from his own people. This was not the foreign captors who initiated this. This was corruption within the faith community.
the judge at the second trial makes a public statement showing that he does not have responsibility for the death. Some manuscripts have katharos, but the oldest one has athos. Innocent am I concerning the blood of this one, and that's the female pronoun. Innocent am I concerning the blood of this one, and that's masculine for Jesus. A minor difference here. Daniel uses ego, and Pilate uses am. In Greek, you can use either word. It doesn't matter which. And finally, the climactic parallel. When Jesus is on the cross, when Susanna is closest to death, they both have a similar expression. Now, in the Bible, to cry out with a great voice is an idiom, a standard way of saying this is heartfelt expression. Usually it's prayer. Seventy times you find that in the Bible. But with this exact phrasing, with phone megale right next together, those two words, great voice, and the specific verb, anaboisen, rather than half a dozen different verbs for crying out. This is unique to the woman Susanna in the Old Testament and the man Jesus in the New. For a person on the point of death, we have another instance of it, uh, a couple, more, two more instances of it for someone who's not on the point of death. But it's a very stressful moment. For the point of death, it's only Jesus and Susanna. Anaboesen de phone magale Susanna, kai epeng potheos, kai edu apothnisku. Anaboesen ho Jesus phone magale legon heli, theimu, theimu, krachsas phone magale. Afikain tonuma. In Matthew, we have the phrase of the great voice repeated with a different verb for crying out. No words this time. You can tell from the sound, krachsas. It's a rattling sound, a harsh sound. This is the death cry. Taking all the comparisons together, it becomes clear that the ordeal of Susanna in the Old Testament is nothing less than the narrative template, the pattern of narration for the Passion of Christ. The Old Testament person used most often in the New Testament account to speak of the Passion of Christ is a married woman with children. That is useful to realize. It points very strongly to the equal created possibility of women as well as men to become holy. Susanna was so well known as a type of Christ that you find her dozens of times in early Christian art, in the catacombs, on sarcophagi, in frescoes, on small religi religious works of art that were, you could carry around. She was so familiar that it has been said by a famous art historian, Kurt Weitzman, that the early Christian could not look at a depiction of Jonah without thinking of Christ. Jonah going into the whale for the death and burial of Christ, Jonah emerging for the resurrection of Christ. I think the same is true of Susanna. And here is an indication of that. Well, 
In this sarcophagus, several scenes depict Susanna. These two are side by side. Here's Susanna in the garden about to be arrested. Two art details that are so good, I must include them. This learned woman is often shown with a book or a scroll. And notice she's holding it open for us and for the elder. The only other persons in Christian art of this period who hold a scroll open for somebody else are an apostle or Jesus. Almost always it's Jesus. So this is a very affirmative role for her to have. In the biblical account of Susanna, when the elders try to coerce her, they misunderstand the law, and she corrects them in what she says. So I think the artist is saying, look, elders, this is really what the law is. You've got it wrong. They say, no one will see us, and she says, we are in the sight of God. She has a theological awareness they lack. Notice also, the elders' heads are lower than hers. Often early Christian art and medieval art will use a person's stature to show spiritual character stature. And that's here too. Now this, you will recognize some water is being poured and Pilate is to the side thinking. Pilate washing his hands is a frequent event shown in early Christian art. But usually, Jesus is standing before him and a guard is holding Jesus by his arm or by both arms. Jesus is not here. The artist is letting Susanna, arrested, stand in for Susanna, stand in for Christ at his trial. The only other Old Testament figure I know to have that familiarity and role is Isaac on what's called the two brothers sarcophagus. Similarly, Isaac is depicted, and next to him is a scene of Pilate washing his hands without Jesus because Isaac is there. This shows how very familiar she was. But that very familiarity prompted Jewish rejection of her. She was popular among the Jews before this time. She's the only woman who was quoted in a prayer for deliverance in some pre-Christian Jewish texts. But once she became so important to Christians, the Jews removed her from their scriptures. And as I say, one of the most successful anti-Christian programs of propaganda was launched at the very start of Christianity and produced finally the Masoretic text of the 10th or 11th century. This began in the first century with anti-Christian revisers to whom Christian belief seemed blasphemy. They went so far as to adjust their own scriptures to prevent, they hoped, Christian interpretation. Sometimes they removed a single word or changed a single word. In Psalm 21, that Jesus cries out from the cross, one of the poignant verses is when Jesus quotes the part, when the, the evangelists quote the part, they have pierced my hands and my feet. A minor change in one of the Hebrew words changed that into, they have made my hands and feet ugly a way of distancing it from Christian interpretation. Um, sometimes passages were reordered within a book to make it seem that a prophecy had been fulfilled in the historical time of the past. The Masoretic text also deleted certain words and whole chapters and even whole books This is fascinating, too. In all of scripture, only two persons are reported to have prayed in agony. 
before facing death for all the people. Esther and Jesus. It's a very striking parallel. An agony thanatu, in agony of death. That is Esther's situation. And the Jewish revisers took out the entire chapter with her prayer. They took out several other passages as well, but that's, I think, the most dramatic removal. They also took out Susanna's entire history. But the original 14-chapter book is what Jesus and his followers knew and used. Originally, Susanna's history was first. If you think about it, Daniel is a boy in this account. It has to be first. He's older in every other chapter. Hippolytus of Rome wrote the first commentary, and he treats it in the third century as the first chapter. But that got changed, and it affected the Greek Bible as you have it. Origen who strongly thought Susanna's account was canonical and very important, he cites it in half a dozen commentaries and in letters and in homilies as well. He wanted to promote conversation with the Jews and realized to do this, he must meet them on their own ground. So, he got, gathered together a lot of materials and put them in one six-fold hexapla mm -hmm. manuscript. First, the Greek. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the Hebrew. And then he transliterated the Hebrew into Greek. The next two are Greek translations of the Hebrew made during the Christian era. Mm -hmm. So these are, have some post-Christian, anti-Christian elements. Aquila and Symmachus. Only then do you get to the Septuagint, mm -hmm. which is older than these two by several hundred years. And finally, you get the translation by Theodosian, which is important for Susanna because he wrote in the first century, but in the first century before Christ, rabbis in Palestine had been dissatisfied with the Greek edition of the book of Daniel. And that's the one book of the Bible they revised. So Theodosian simply took that and inserted it into his new translation. But Origen was using the material available in the third century, in the 230s. And by then, Susanna had been taken out. So he treated it as something that was extant in the Greek, but not in the Hebrew. Now, he only meant this for mm -hmm. conversation with the Jews. But it appears that people took this as decisive for how to present the Greek text. And you very soon get a separation of Susanna's history from the book of Daniel, often with a heading, Susanna, as if it were not part of it. I've got a, a separate essay. I could do a separate talk on the prophetic structure and meaning of the book in Daniel. It's important that she's first. She's first in the history. Daniel's vision of the Son of Man is first in the visions. That's prophetically important. Mm -hmm. But we live with what is, and her book was was shifted, with the odd result that though the Greek was the basis of interpreting Susanna as a type of Christ, it was the Latin tradition that developed that typology. Many of the fathers preached on her during Holy Week itself. Maximus of Turin, Ambrose, Augustine. Susanna arrested in a garden is like Christ arrested in the garden. And then on Good Friday, Susanna at her trial is like Christ at his trial. And the earliest Roman lectionary 
paired Susanna with a reading that helped that. Now, the rest of Susanna's prayer in Latin became popular as an additional way of showing her as a type of Christ. Eternal God, you who are the knower of hidden things, who know all things before they occur, you know that they have borne false witness against me. And behold, I die, although I have done none of the things which they have maliciously composed against me. In the 14th century, this was noticed. A Franciscan friar in his prayer began his sermon with Susanna's words, and then goes on to say, Christ himself could say these words while hanging on the cross. That struck a chord with people. There were a wealth of new sermons on this, preached in parishes across Europe, at a church council, to at least one pope, if not two. And there are more than 60 manuscripts that include these sermons. And two of them are in Eastern Europe, very close to Ukraine. One was by Yendrich, Bishop of Wildstein in Czechia, and another by Andrea Nozek, Abbot of the Benedictine Monastery at Tyniec in Poland. Now, back in 1895, a manuscript with this sermon had this call number. I don't know where it is today, but it's, it's very interesting that it appears that this survives. I would love to find out where it is and try to get a, a copy of it so I could see if I could do some work with it, see what, what Nozek, what Father Nozek does with this parallel. Now in Greek we do have, we did have one text, only one, and it was a play, a liturgical play. How Susanna may show the death of Christ. So this is Susanna again, foreshadowing the passion of Christ. Eustathius of Antioch is the one who tells us about it, and he attributed it to the eighth century theologian, John of Damascus. But this has been lost. Now, when Cyril and Methodius came here, Ivan Ilyev says he may have introduced the book of Daniel through the Prophetologion. In turn, this suggests that possibly Susanna would have been in that, but I don't know. And if anybody here knows if Susanna has ever been in the Prophetologion, again, I would be most interested in that. Whether or not she was in the Prophetologion, we know she was in the Slavonic translations of Hippolytus of Rome, perhaps as early as the 10th century, so right with the evangelization of Rus. She's still in the commentary by the time you get to the 15th or 16th century, but it's been reordered, so she's no longer in initial position. So, never, it appears, has an Orthodox or an Eastern Catholic cleric preached on Susanna as a type of Christ. I've been looking for this, and I, there are many sermons on her, but not as a type of Christ. They are straight history. And I think this comes about because of the difference between the Latin Mass and the Divine Liturgy. The Latin Mass has four scriptural readings. An Old Testament reading, and that includes Susanna, from the 6th century for every Roman parish, Susanna was read once a year in combination with the Gospel about the Passion. Um, I'm sorry, they altered that um, with a, something that suggests that, with John 8. But the Divine Liturgy does not have an Old Testament reading. So the Eastern focus 
on women as types of Christ has been on women who are in the Gospels, especially the woman who finds the drachma. The shepherd who finds the lost sheep and the woman who finds the lost drachma are both taken as prefiguring Christ who finds the lost sinner, who finds the lost soul imprinted with the image of God the way the drachma is imprinted with the image of the emperor. Uh, and the good shepherd is what you see in the first. And the wisdom of Christ, the Sophia of Christ, so they used a feminine noun for the woman to represent Christ. St. John Chrysostom, Clement of Alexandria, Romanos the Mellowed, they developed this. And it's still in use in Greece. I haven't seen it outside Greece, but it's in Greece. Now, in order for a priest today in Ukraine to preach on Susanna as a type of Christ, he must watch the readings and the liturgy, the church calendar, to see when it would be fitting to mention this. And I think anybody who preached on this could readily use it as an occasion to point also to theosis. That's the basis for why women were considered to be types of Christ. And this could reclaim for Ukrainian Greek Catholics a righteous and learned woman of the Old Testament who was a heroine in her own right and also a fitting model itself for Ukraine in the new millennium. Well, I'm going to pause here and then in the conversation I'll go on with images because you've been sitting long enough. <laughs> I want you to have a chance to speak. Thank you so much for your attention.